Vultures are animals that swoop down from clifftops and feast on the flesh of dead things on the beach below. Is this something we should really aspire to as poker players? Yes, absolutely we should. Because the poker vulture, guys, is a creature that sits on the clifftop and swoops down and takes all of the EV, takes all of that juicy dead money from common mundane small pots that make up the gist of your win rate. 25 NL regs and microstakes players like my student Jess are usually the opposite of the poker vulture. They're kind of asleep and the only thing that really swoops down from the cliff is their red line which dive bombs down to the rocks below and incinerates itself into a million pieces. 25 NL players have very bad red lines usually and Jess is no exception. Today you're going to see real poker coaching. Not preaching or lecturing, not just me ranting and hoping that my thoughts are magically installed in my student's brain, but what I really tried to do today to fix this red line issue is to plant myself in Jess's shoes, see the world through her eyes, and guide her down the path to poker vultury. I hope you enjoy as we try to win more than our fair share of small pots, and avoid making bad folds, avoid forgetting to hand read, and just try to nail more of these common spots. Let's go. Hello, Jess. Hello. How are you? How are you? I'm very, very good, thank you. How's poker been going? I have no idea. I think that's kind of one of the things that's been hard for me recently. I honestly have no idea how I'm doing. I've seen little glimpses of my bankroll, but I haven't really been checking my results on my graph to try and get out of that kind of results orientated. And it's been genuinely like an addiction, like I've likened it to when I quit smoking just constantly wanting a cigarette i constantly want to check check my results whenever i've bit up a session this is interesting because i said how's poker been going and you said i don't know because you hadn't been checking your results you've implied that you have no idea how poker has been going now i'm going to object here and i'm going to say that the very reason we're trying not to check the results is so that we can assign other metrics to describe how poker is going so how else might we steer away from graphs and bankrolls? And we will talk about this, this quitting smoking feeling that you're getting as a cold turkey approach, really. And we will talk about this. But how else might you answer that question? How has poker been going? Just kind of like how I'm feeling after sessions, maybe. Like, I don't know, but a bit of journaling or something could help. Just how I've generally felt I played during the hands. Kind of having a little review afterwards and looking at some of the parts. And just to see how, see if I've been playing them well. Like the video that you put out the other day about the intense, like kind of study sessions. I think that might be a good idea for me every now and then when I was watching that. I was thinking this might be good for me to just kind of line check as I'm playing like every now and then. It's like a study session. Yeah. So focus sessions are basically this practice where we play not because we're trying to put in mass volume, not because we're trying to grind. It's like, I'm on the grind. Always sounds like you're just like playing 19 tables for six hours when people say that. And sure, you do need to put in volume to achieve goals in poker. That is important. I think what's equally important is accountability. And I think accountability is being able to walk away from a session and say, well, the meaningful hands that really gave me cause for concern there that like challenged me, the ones that weren't totally obvious to me, I've at least gone through some of them afterwards and been aware of how I've played. And I think that's one thing that could really help is, you know, when people stop smoking, sometimes they start eating like hard boiled sweets instead, or they chew chewing gum or they take up crochet. So they have something to do with their hands. I don't know, something yeah. like this. Maybe you need to transfer all of this restless energy that's been created by the void we established when we got rid of your permission to look at your graphs basically we said we're not going to look at graphs until a certain date has elapsed why don't we replace that with accountability why don't you make a spreadsheet why don't you grade yourself a b c d e f on a hand in game thoughts out of game thoughts long term lessons to ingrain three columns bam five hands after every session done 20 minutes non-negotiable accountability a new way of answering the question how is poker going yeah that sounds good so next week i'll ask you again and you will say that you do know how it's going, and yet you haven't relapsed and checked your graph. Yes, that sounds like a plan, definitely. <laughs> Where do you feel that comes from? That craving to check your results, that sort of results obsession that we've talked about you suffering from before. Where do you think it comes from? And do you use, are you fully on board with like why we're trying to debunk it, why we're trying to get rid of that? 
Yeah, I think I am definitely on board about it. I think it comes from competitiveness, just from playing footy and wanting to win. And like the balance is kind of the score in poker. I feel like it definitely links to that. And also like my ambitions, I suppose, like I'm playing 25 an hour at the minute and I'd love to one day get up. Like ideally, my long term goal from poker is to be at 100, 200 an hour, making a nice little side income off of like a kind of part time hobby that I enjoy. Yeah. It's not to ever do it full time, but like that's trying to focus on those goals and to get to those goals, um, that balance obviously has to go up. But also my play does as well. So like it's good to concentrate on the hands after as well. But I think that's really important. The more we concentrate on the balance, the less of our mental energy we can actually put into concentrating on our play. So I think you've fallen into a trap of really becoming quite results oriented not just with sessions but the results of hands you know we talked before about some of the language that you use i could barrel here to try to win the pot maybe we should just not spew and give this one up like this kind of language that we're using to describe the outcome of a hand give up the pot pick this one up take the pot down all of these phrases that i've heard you use they're all about keeping score as if a game of football is analogous to one hand of poker, not even a session, but one hand of poker. But really, the game of football, fine. You want to use the game of football as an analogy. That works with poker too, but only if you take like three months of poker. That's 90 minutes of football, three months of poker, not one hand, not one session. And that's what we need to keep remembering. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Without a doubt. How to become a poker vulture. Vultures feed on dead things. They fly down from the cliffs and they munch away on fish that have landed on the beach and stuff like that. But they're cool creatures, right? Because they clean up the world and they clean up the environment and they eat the stuff that no one else wants to eat. So hats off to the vulture. Vulture, my friend, you have our approval. How do we take this to poker? What about all that carrion? What about all those carcasses of pots that nobody really wants that much? What about spots where people's ranges are way too wide, where they're over bluffing, over stabbing, over sea betting? What about underprotected checking ranges? All of these places are situations, Jess, where we can embody the spirit of the poker vulture. I know that sloths are your favorite animals, not vultures, but let's make the vulture our spirit animal for today because I've seen your red line and you haven't because you're not allowed to look at it anymore, but your red line goes down too smoothly and too stably which means that in the small pots, we are just not winning enough. We're folding too soon sometimes. We're not aware of the threshold between calling and folding or raising, and we're not investing enough money, and we're not being aggressive enough. So that's our focus for today is becoming the vulture. Let's do it. Queens in the hijack, under the gun opens two BBs. We three bet to 6.8, and they make the call onto a flop of four, deuce four. They check. This is a pretty favorable world for our range, and we're going to be doing well here. We're going to have all the overpairs. We're going to have a big nut advantage. We're going to have quite a lot of equity, range versus range. And paired boards are really, really nice for the three better because it means that your big overpairs are invulnerable. Like they're not going to get sucked out on as easily by stuff like King Jack or Jack 10 or something like that. In other words, when you have aces here, you have an invincible two pair that can never be beaten by another two pair. That's another point. So very good spot for your range. When you have a big nut advantage here, you can bet bigger than this. So when your value region is predominantly like really big hands, you can already start to bet like 50%, 60% pot, something of that nature. This isn't like a blunder, but it's worth bearing in mind that in three bet pots on low boards, especially low paired boards, we want to use large sizing. Something to remember. Right. Villain calls, king turn. Now, in Carrot Poker School language, we talk at great length in our academic, rigorous classroom style course, the Carrot Poker School, about world favorability. This is something we've been touching on a little bit. Whose range is entitled to more of the pot here? So if you imagine the pot is 100% of the pot. The pot is 100% of the pot. That's a tautology. It's a dumb thing to say, but it's true. What percentage of that 100% of the pot does your range have and what does villains have? Don't tell me exactly... But do you think your range is entitled to more of the pot than villains or less of the pot than villains from a range versus range standpoint? I would say possibly less, but very close to like break even, like 50 50 at this point, maybe. That's coming from he sometimes does have like ace kings in his range. He's definitely still got aces in his range. Maybe not kings as much anymore because the kings came. Yeah, the king is a bit of a problem card for us, I think, just because hands like ace king. 
would probably call check call that flop pair. So I think ace is four bets pre-flop usually. Right. And ace king often four bets pre-flop in these positions as well. Not always, like you'll have some ace king, but what you're doing, it's actually quite myopic. You're looking at a very small part of the picture here. And you're not comparing your range to his range. What you're doing is basically looking at the opponent's range, seeing some things you don't like in it, and reacting out of a startled sort of recoiling, almost like a snake that's kind of like, ah, like just sees you and sort of like pounces upright and is like alarmed, like you're being very alarmed and startled by this card. Mm -hmm. But why don't we compare symmetries and asymmetries here, right? Let's have a look at the ways in which these two ranges are asymmetrical. You've seen about the flop they've called. What are the types of hands that they have at a higher density than you do? And what are the kinds of hands that your range has at a higher density than theirs does? Our range has probably more ace kings, bigger pairs, like you were saying, a four bet pre is good with like aces kings, even ace king. Our range has a lot of stronger hands still here. Their range definitely has like sevens to jacks, like that kind of hand. More than we do, right? Like yeah, they have a rich more. density of sevens, eights, nines, tens. We have some of those hands, but they're not as big a percentage of our range as they are a villain's range, because our range is more total combos than their range. So they actually have a hand like jacks, tens, nines, eights, ace queen suited backdoor, much more often than we do. Now, who has more combos of king ten, king jack, and king queen, and why? Probably us, because we're more likely to free bet them, and they're not. They're not going to be calling those out position. Certainly not off suited ones. And also on the flop, they're going to fold like the king queen of hearts, but we are going to see bet that at really high frequency, right? Yeah. So the king hits their flop folding range. Think about that. The king hits the stuff they folded on the flop. That's the stuff they don't have anymore. So overall, I would say that world favorability has three elements to it. Position, that's good for us. We're in position. Nut advantage, who has more nutty hands. And overall sort of equity. These are the main ingredients to world favorability. So given that we're in position, we have a nut advantage and the king smashes loads of our flop air and makes their sevens and eights and sixes worse. I would actually say that we have all three of those things in our favor and we're in a very favorable world. But what does that mean to be in a very favorable world? What does that allow us to do? So we have like more share of the pot, right? If right. We're in a very favorable world. It allows us to try and keep hands in the pot, I suppose, because we're winning quite a lot at the minute. So it's not, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know about this one, because if, say, like we bet big on this board, Lots of the 7s, 8s, 9s, 10s, jacks will quite happily fold because of the king. But we kind of, do we want them sticking around in the pot? I'm not quite sure. Well, it depends what we have. It depends if we're bluffing or not. So let's take this from both standpoints. So if we're bluffing, if we have a hand like ace jack, what does the world favorability do to our fold equity? Because bluffing is concerned with fold equity. Bluffs 101. If you're bluffing, your fold equity is the be all and end all of whether you should bluff. I mean, there's other things that matter too, but this is a pretty big factor. Do we have more fold equity in favorable worlds or less? More. Yeah. So if you're like in a fight with someone and they're like way bigger and stronger than you, you're much more likely to run away. So villain's range is way weaker than yours. They're more likely to run away more often. That's the idea. Yeah. So you have more fold equity. So that means that when you have a hand like Ace Jack, you can bluff. It means that you don't have to be as selective with your bluffs as you would have to be in a world that was less favorable. So in some worlds where it's really unfavorable for your range, You've got to be really careful of what you bluff and you may need like a flush draw or something like that. You may need like a, a really good redraw or some implied odds or at least a gutter or some standard like that. Here you don't. So here our bluffs can kind of go a bit crazy. We can bet with impunity here. We can bluff a lot here. Doesn't mean we have to, but we should be bluffing a lot by the river here. If we have a hand like ace five, ace eight, jack ten, we should be betting a lot. This turn is probably played as close to a range bet in GTO because it's that favorable a world for you. Queens is a value hand, you can value bet, and you probably should very often. The idea is, in game theory, that if you're in a favorable world, you absolutely want to put money in the pot, because villain still has to continue with a lot of their range. Don't worry about the times they fold, that's not up to you. If they fold tens here, so what? What are you going to do, check back and mind control them to going all in on the river? You're not going to harvest way more money on average by checking than by betting. That's just not the way poker works. If they had a really air-heavy range that was going to bluff the river a lot, but fold the turn a lot, then it would maybe make sense to check back and say, well, now I'm trying to induce you to bluff because your range is full of air. But that's not the case. Villain's range is weaker than ours, but it's not because it's full of air. That's because it has a lot of mediocre, like, meh kind of hands in it. You want to value bet a lot against them. The idea is 
let's say we're playing a game where I get to take Chelsea and I get to put them against Tranmere Rovers or some other terrible team for anyone who doesn't know how English soccer slash football works. I think Tranmere Rovers are a pretty terrible team. Let me use Northampton Town, where my family are from, because they're definitely a really terrible team. I get to take Chelsea and put them against your Northampton Town. And the odds are 50-50. I offer you, I bet, no, no, they're not 50-50. Let's say I bet pot that my Chelsea will beat your Northampton Town. Should you call or should you fold? Call at the minute. <laughs> Jokes aside, though, <laughs> if you care about money, fold. you would fold. Now, what if I check to you? If I say, I don't want to put any money on whether there's a pot in the middle, there's a dead amount of money in the middle, and I say, I don't want to put any money on this. I'm going to check, instead of betting, that my Chelsea will beat your Northampton Town. Do you now bet in this GTO framework? Remember, uh, I know hmm. that you have Northampton Town and you know I have Chelsea. That's the extent of our ranges of teams. Oh. Do you bet? How often do you bet? Barely ever. Never. Take that bet? Yeah, Literally no. never, because I'll just raise you and then you'll have to fold or I'll call and then you'll lose a lot. So you would never bet there. So if you check your really strong range when you have a value hand, you check your Chelsea here. How often do they bet their Northampton Town? In position. So we're checking Chelsea. Say you check, well, your range is Chelsea. Let me turn your cards off. Say you check with Chelsea and they have Northampton Town. Should they bet often? Uh, no, not if they know we've got no, Chelsea. because they know you've got Chelsea. So in game theory, they know what you have range-wise and you know what they have. That's how game theory operates. So the reason that you should bet a lot in really favorable worlds for your range for value, we've gone over the bluff part. Your bluffs have a lot of fold equity because if one-tenth of the time I actually had a Sunday league team, I had like the guys that work in the carpet factories team down the road, and you didn't know that with your Northampton Town, you would fold the best team. Assuming Northampton Town could beat the carpet factory Sunday league team. Maybe they couldn't. You get the point, right? But with the value element of this weird analogy, what's going on here is that when your team is so strong, like when your range is so strong, and you check, your opponent's not incentivized to do much betting, so absolutely you should still value bet a lot. There's no point having a weak range in the pot with you if you're not making any money from it. The goal is to make money when you have really high equity value betting hands, not to just leave villains random hands in the pot for no reason. So what we need to do here is bet really often for value, and usually we should just bet queens if given the chance. Okay, this is really super weird because we get donk bet into here, but it's really important to understand that the king is much better for your range by comparing and contrasting the two ranges and their asymmetries, and then understanding why you should bet really often on this card. You should bet your value bets because you don't get money by checking very often with them. He doesn't bet. He knows this. And you should bet your bluffs because your fold equity is really high. That's why we range bet in really favorable worlds. That's the thing behind it. A lot of people don't know why we range bet in favorable worlds. They know we do, but they don't know why. Okay. We face this. Your thoughts? Definitely calling. I don't know if I ever have any raises here just because Duncan's just so weird. Like 100% I'm calling without a doubt. And I maybe would have thought about raising, but raising this hand or having a raising range in general just having a raising range yeah i would say that it's kind of okay to have one at this spr it's not like villain donked pot if villain donked pot the spr is taking care of itself the pot is growing like so nicely you're in position you have absolute control of pot growth later you don't have to raise even with ace king or aces you don't have to against this sizing i'm quite a fan of just you know pumping up with ace-king again. I think this range is quite merged. I think like there might be some urgency to raise there. And I think playing only a call strategy here would be the thing to do in theory, but that's because villain's range would be much more polarized in theory than it is here. Here it's going to be full of stuff like tens. This is almost certainly a recreational player. Let me give you a tip here, Jess, and this is also to the audience as well. Line equals player type equals read. So line, player type, read. The line tells us about the player type and the player type tells us about what this action means. So who does this? What kind of player does this? Recreational donk in turns when I'm pretty much always going to bet. Horrible fish does this. Dumb, horrible fish. Recreational. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, guys. Easy on him. <laughs> yeah, okay, fun player, recreational. Let's go with that. Back in my day... You know, we used to just call them all fish, but yeah, recreational player, I guess that's the, the, the PC term. So we want to go ahead and prescribe this player what kind of range based on being a recreational? What kind of range? Lots of King X for sure, because they've just like made a pair. Not that many King X though, because they don't get here with that many King X though. They get here with some, but they fold a lot of King X on the flop or pre-flop. I mean, you said yourself, you don't think people are usually calling that many King X to this node. I'll give you some King X, but I don't want you leaping to the conclusion that this is really King X heavy. 
Yeah, I feel like this is one of those hands where I've seen a king and just decided they've got it, which I've tried to get out of my flop thinking when I see an ace. And I think I've been quite successful with that. But like, this feels like that's crept back in. Maybe I've just seen a king and they're like, ugh. Zoom out, Jess. Zoom out. You've got to zoom out more often. The way you go through hands sometimes is extremely myopic. It's really like tunnel visiony. And what you need to do is calm down from the reaction of this king coming in this bet happening because i get it these two things happened that we didn't really like when we have queens specifically as much as our range might love this card obviously our queens would rather it didn't come and our queens would rather villain didn't do this perhaps but that doesn't mean that you have to now react out of just that factor being the be all and end all of the world like that becomes your universe to some extent here and that's an issue zoom out what's the broader picture scour the whole landscape and then make a decision i think it's probably quite fair to assign this player loads of hands that aren't a king many of them are a bluff what could villain be bluffing with here just give me an example of a hand that makes it here and just bluffs the turn like ace jack yeah give me an example of a merged hand that a recreational player is not going to understand how to play and is going to do this with sometimes like jacks maybe yeah absolutely so this they have a king thing I don't think you want to think like that. I don't think you want to be that kind of poker player because this isn't actually being a poker player. This is being a reactor, basically. You're reacting, not thinking. So part of being a vulture today is all about surveying the landscape, flying around the cliffs, looking down at the beach and seeing the whole beach, not just seeing one thing and being like that. So the vulture looks around, swoops down, and feasts on a lovely carcass. So that's what we are going to do. Not literally. So call. Easy call. We do call. Four of spades. Boom. Range this player. What's going on? And then tell me what you should do. This could maybe be like any pocket pair now because they just see a full house and they've got a strong hand. I think we can take out like maybe the ace jack. Like they haven't got pure bluffs here. I think they've got lots of pocket pairs just because this seems like quite a underbluffed node. Okay, let's stop a second. How often would they need to bluff here in GTO for this sizing in order to be balanced? So before we say that something's under bluffed, we need to know what that means in this specific context. When they bet a third of the pot, how much of their range is allowed to be a bluff? Not much. How much? I've no idea about percentage, but tiny because we're going to call it off easy. I'll give you a clue. It's the same as your required equity. The amount of equity you need here is the very same thing as how often they're meant to be bluffing if they're going to make you indifferent. So that's 20%. Someone came on my last video and said, actually the pot odds is blah, blah, blah. They were talking about a different metric. There are two metrics. One is the required equity that we need and how often they're meant to be bluffing. If they're balanced, that's the same metric. And then another metric is how much fold equity someone needs when they're bluffing and then how much of someone's range they're meant to defend. Those two things go hand in hand as well. So to the person that came on left seven really rude disrespectful points i replied to them i took half an hour out my sunday morning replied to this person they then deleted their post after i answered it maybe they were drunk and they like regretted it the next day but i don't know man that was pretty inconsiderate i took loads of time writing that reply and i didn't even save it it was a good reply so i'm pissed back to this you go into the hand reading mode here and we say well under bluffed is a strong claim now we're saying that villain has a value bet 80% of the time that they're betting because you need 20% to call here, right? So we're saying if it's under bluff, we're saying that villain is bluffing less than 20% of the time. I don't think we can say that. I also don't think you can just take a stack out of the range. You're not God. You don't just get to remove all of the combos that someone has of bluffs here. You're not psychic. They could still be bluffing for all we know. Maybe you don't think it's that frequent compared to like nines and I agree. You'll probably see like tens or jacks or nines more often than a stack, but that doesn't mean we just take it out and toss it away and say it's not there. So what are we left with? We're left with a few King X that beat us, but that's often going to bet bigger on this node. And then we're left with pocket pairs and we're left with some bluffs and we probably win about, I don't know, give me a percentage. Now that we've done this analysis, how often do you think you win here? I reckon probably about 50% over half. Yeah, I'd say over half, maybe 60. I'm thinking about here, maybe even more. So in-game Jess, who's not you, it's not you I'm speaking to, in-game Jess folded. She folded. Now, I want you to, you know how I impersonate Jordan Peterson all the time and other people, right? Yeah. Why don't you impersonate in-game Jess? And I want you to honestly just, imagine you're doing a parody of her, you're doing stand-up comedy. What's she saying when she folds here? Like, how does she get to this decision? Uh, she just hates the king coming on the turn and two bets coming, which aren't even really big bets. So 
and I absolutely hate that I folded. <laughs> I have no idea why I folded here. They That's so yourself small. from it. You don't want to fold here. So it's not you that folded. It's this in-game shell-shocked creature that folded. Like, I'm talking to a rational conscious mind right now, and this fold was made by the lizard brain version. So I don't even feel like it's fair to say it's the same person. I think while you need to take accountability for that, this has come from a place of non-analysis, non-engagement, and myopic tunnel vision. That's what's caused this fold. It's been an abstinence of thought. You've actually said, I'm not going to hand read. Or I'm going to hand read with these giant leaps and these huge assumptions. Like, he doesn't have Ace Jack. He's got a king, because I've decided it earlier. And there's not enough of the methodical, okay, what do we see here from a population of individuals? What do we see here? But your results orientation makes it hard for you to do that because you're already trying to state the outcome of a hand. You're so obsessed with outcome that you're trying to state the outcome two streets before showdown. This is why we're working on results orientation. I think this is linked to your mental game. Yeah, definitely. I'd be screaming at this person saying, why the hell are you folding? I'm getting such good odds. <laughs> now, I want you to talk to her and I want you to explain to her like a teacher would explain to a student how she can improve in a hand like this in future. Give her a couple of bullet points and be nice. Bullet points. First one is you only need 20% equity to call here, I think. You have more than that for sure. So at the worst, it's a good call anyway. Another bullet point would be that we, you know, this is a very favorable world for our range, being the prefop free batter. We're good here quite a lot. And this person is a recreational. They do daft things. <laughs> Just kind of pay attention. Pay attention to pot odds. Pay attention to the line villains taken. Do a bit more hand reading and, you know, think about ranges and stuff. Zoom out. Bird's eye view. That's all really good. But once you are in this threatened, heightened state where you're already forming conclusions about what's happened here and how the story will go, you're too far zoomed in to see the forest for the trees. You're like really too far ingrained. So it's time to step back and say, okay, let's assess this objectively. Let's look at the overall picture. Yeah, I think that's all really good. I want you to do that more. I want you to really take accountability to how you're thinking in game. I don't want you to just settle for, oh, that was daft. I hope I never do that again. Because you will do that again. Because these are your habits. While I'm saying be nice to this person, she's a different version of you. She's still you. She's the mode you go into when you're playing. Let's be aware that we have these tendencies and really try to fix them. Jack 10, 3 bet, call 775. We see bet. This is not such a good board for your range. Not a great world. You can still see bet of Lost Draw. But you should be checking at a high frequency overall on this board. And this hand can bet or check. You do not have to bet here. There's no reason why you have to. When you start learning poker, you'll hear people say, you're going to bet the first star because you're semi bluff And it's like this is nonsense because like checking, you still have loads of equity. You fold equity later. You can hit a pair. You can hit a flush. Everything is good. Checking is a rich line. It's rich in EV. So is betting. You can't really go wrong here, but you do not have to bet. This is optional. Mm -hmm. Filling calls. Awful, awful world, right? When we glance at this world, we can say out of position. Awful texture that rewards the calling range pre-flop and the range that had a reason to hang around on the flop. It's dense in mediocre stuff and mediocre stuff hits this card. This is a terrible card for our range, a great card for villain's range. You should probably check your whole range here or close to it. I like the check here. You should check a lot here. Villain checks back. King River. Assess favorability. How does the king swing the favorability that we were left with on the turn it makes it less favorable for you for us for your hand or for, for your range what do you think about here because i'm going to turn your for my hand off. no 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 let's Sorry. get rid of your hand yeah let's okay get rid of your hand cool when we talk about favorability we are always talking it won't let about me turn range. your cards off there we go yeah we're always talking about your range okay so what does your range make of this for our range this is quite good we definitely kind of see about an ace king and then check a turn We've got lots of, we've still got lots of King X at this point because they never bet the turn. Do they? Do they? Yeah, I'd say. Do so they have too. as much? Do they have as much of a concentration? Why, why not? No, because a lot of the offsuited combos of King X are going to fold pre quite a lot of the time. And then even some of the suited ones aren't going to, I mean, the hearts come out here, but like King Green Diamonds, for example, might not have too much of an impotence to imp the whatever that word is, might not have too much of a reason to call. A impetus. Flop impetus. Let's just call them all impotent. They're all impotent regs anyway. It's fine. Let's just go with that. I like that that as a player label for a certain type of opponent that like never bluffs or something. Impotent reg. 
Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Rebranding player label circus. Are King X suited kind of diamonds and stuff? And even hearts at this point don't have much of a reason to hang around. Definitely spades do. We block like King Jack clubs, Jack Queen of clubs. So they have less than us, right? There are hearts and diamonds ones. These are the things that go away on the flop the most often. We like this river a lot. So this river will really swing the favorability in a big way. So I wonder if I can be a bit nerdy here and bring up Pio Solver for just a second. So this is the flop. And because this is Pio, we can do something pretty cool. And we can actually look at EV street by street. So on the flop, the small blind is in a not as good a world as like before where we were range betting and we're entitled to like the whole pot and stuff like that. But we're in an okay world. 55% pot share. It's closer to neutral, but it's still pretty good. And what I've done there is I've expressed the pot share in a percentage. So when it says out of position EV 55%, it means that our range is entitled to 55% of the pot. Now, some hands within our range are entitled to less and some are entitled to more. So when we have King Jack off, we're only entitled to 12% of the pot. When we have Queens, we're entitled to 150% of the pot. That's very possible because, of course, we have implied odds and we can earn money that's extra to what's in the pot by betting. That's fine. You can never have more than 100% equity. You can have more than 100% pot share EV. These are all concepts from the Carrot Poker School as well. When we go for like a, a bet here, I went for a B60. It doesn't really matter. Villain calls and the six of spades comes. Again, we can track favorability and this is just dreadful for us, right? There's some betting, but it's pretty close to a range check. And you are allowed to bet your hand. Like it's no problem, but you're also allowed to check. It's not a mandatory bet. But when you look at the EV here for your range, it's only 39% of the pot. So your range is getting killed here. So you do a lot of checking when your range is getting slaughtered, just like you do a lot of checking when you have Northampton Town and I have Chelsea. Same thing. Yeah. So we go for a check, they check back. Now watch what happens to the pot share EV on the river. When the king comes, you are back in a really favorable world because two amazing things just happen for you. One, villain checked the turn. They didn't bet. They're going to bet really often with their best hands, like their sets and boats and stuff. And secondly, the King King, which favors you immensely, as we've said. So now that you're in this kind of world, you have to bluff because you're in a favorable world with a terrible hand. So that's like, I usually have Chelsea, but this one time I have the Sunday League Carpet Factory guys team, but you don't know that. And I'm bluffing. I have to bluff now because you're going to fold because you think I have Chelsea a lot. It's like that. Do you see how important it is to get good at world favorability, to understand like what textures are good for you, positions are good for you? That sort of thing. Yeah, seeing it jumping up that much there on that river, it's yeah, it's like it's a massive thing to, to know when to bluff. Like I think that's what I've been missing as well. Like when not bluffing is a blunder. Absolutely, I, I love that you put it that way because in the carrot poker school, this very thing, not bluffing when your range is killing it and your hand is terrible, is known as river, river blunder theorem. Cringe, right? Look at you cringing at me. I'm coaching you here, Jess. Don't cringe at me when I'm teaching you. Come on, man. Have some respect for your teachers. I can't see you anymore, by the way. Eve. So that was probably even... I don't know if that made it more cringy or less cringy. Maybe more. So effectively, this is River Blunder Theorem because we're not bluffing in a favorable spot for our range. And what we've not done here is we haven't calibrated that the king is great for our range. You're focusing too much again on your hand. Now, in-game Jess did something here in her head that led to checking. What did she do? What did she think? She focused far too much on her hand and just didn't want to fire for whatever reason. Should we peek at how much EV you lose in theory by not bluffing the snowed? Can you handle that? Should we look at it? Yeah, go on then. <laughs> you lose about 8% of the pot. No, a bit less with clubs, actually. Yeah, you lose, yeah, about 8% of the pot here. You should just jam this combo, by the way. Jam is fine, because you have a ton of King X that wants to jam here, because it's effectively the nuts now. Like, it's really strong. So you should jam here. That's the play. And you lose 8% of the pot by not doing it. 8% of 40 big blinds is, like, a lot of... That's quite a lot of big blinds. What's that, like, 3 point something big blinds? That's quite a lot of big blinds to lose. So do be careful about River Blunder Theorem and make sure that you assess favorability. This is really a lesson about favorability today. I'm going to do one more spot, then we're going to wrap this up. And being a vulture is all about knowing where your range gives you the justification to bluff, you know? If yeah. you understand that, you're not going to miss these mandatory bluffs anymore. Like, it's just not going to happen. Right, so King 10, big blind, open from cutoff, call. Now, this is the kind of spot I want you to be really careful, Jess. So King 10 with the King of Spades. This sucks. 
the situation sucks you're not meant to be happy but again against third pot bets remember you need 20 percent pot share to call that's all yeah you have a few factors here that make this a call what are they we've got like overcards to the six when they don't have an ace we've still got like another six outs to outdraw them we've also got the backdoor flush and also sometimes just king eye probably good yeah you nailed it those are exactly the factors redraw when behind showdown value to already be ahead and the king of spades the king of spades is actually quite a big deal here there's quite a big difference between having the king of spades on this node and not having it and it really comes down to a few things one continuing here like on a spade turn you will have enormously higher ev with the king of spades so you'll have more equity but the ev will be like enormously higher on a spade turn than it will be without the king of spades two you're going to block the range villain barrels you with on the turn they're going to bet turn more with the king of spades because they block your raises and calls so you actually reduce their bluff frequency which is good because you'd have to fold to their bluffs on the turn here that's good and thirdly, if a king comes, it can't be a spade, so it can also bring a flush. You can't get semi coolered like that. So the king of spades makes a big difference here. I think folding king 10 of diamonds here is totally fine. But with the king of spades, I think you have to continue this spot. And it's just about being a bit more aware that while this sucks, it doesn't suck enough for you to fold because you only need 20% of the pot to call here. So that's more of a technical point. But focus on being a vulture, surveying the landscape, understanding when your range is doing well, not betting randomly when your range is doing well, but bluffing more not betting like the middle of your range of course but bluffing more and understanding how fold equity works it's a function of range versus range activity you know while you should always play your hand not play your range you should still assess how your range is doing to understand the situation and that's what we're working on so how has today left you feeling quite good i suppose did i fold here i don't even know i can't even remember Oh, no, oh you didn't. Right. You called here. My, my bad. I thought you'd folded. So I was actually throwing you under the bus there. I was like, look, you folded this spot and you didn't even. I think this is certainly a fold. So you played this hand perfectly. <laughs> cool. I was just thinking, please don't say I folded that. <laughs> but yeah, like the queen's hand is kind of disappointing for sure. I definitely need to kind of work on that. There was lots of things through that talk that like, I'm just not focusing on. So yeah, but feeling like feeling quite good because like theoretically i tend to kind of talk a good game even if i'm not playing it <laughs> like i kind of sometimes i'll say stuff about a hand or a line that i should take and then just not follow through when i'm playing sometimes i feel quite good about it and sometimes it's still kind of you know there's lots to do because i'm not always thinking like this when i'm playing and it's annoying because now that I kind of have a bit of a better understanding about the theory, it winds me up when I'm like, why are you folding there? What the hell was that? <laughs> and this hand, I actually remember this hand. This is a standout hand because on GG Poker, if you show one card, maybe you shouldn't be saying this out loud, but if you show one card in the hand history, you can actually see both of the cards that they had. <laughs> and on here, he showed a jack and he had another jack. I am um, so, yeah. utterly unsurprised that he had jacks. He's going to have so many yeah. mergy worse value hands than yours. And 100%. Yeah, you folded a value beater to an overbluffed line that's just really merged as well. You, your mistake is most of the pot in that situation. You know, it's a very, very big blunder. I want to, I, I say that in a positive light because you're still making money. You have rake back and stuff that's on your side, you know, streaming for GG and stuff. You have rake back that's helping, but you are still making money in this game. And we do actually have you breaking even now, by the way. Like overall, like when you came to me, you were losing. We have you pretty much breaking even. I'll show the graph at some point, but you are, I don't want to tell you like exactly how well you're doing, <laughs> but overall there has been a difference since we started this journey. It's slow, and there are a lot of things we have to unpack that are really unhealthy in your game, and we're having a hard time getting the healthy things in, because you're in a different mode when you're playing than when you're talking here. You're in a totally different mode each time, and we need to work on your in-game professionalism and being in this kind of mode a bit more. I think when you sort of let yourself off the hook stress-wise or sort of results-wise and stop trying to predict the outcome of hands and getting so tunnel visioned on that it'll really free you up to be able to use what you know but i can understand it's frustrating because you're not currently using that much of what you know in but you are sometimes of course if, if you weren't at all there'd be no difference in your results and we're already seeing a difference but the scope is big here like if we can get you applying the stuff in these lessons and avoiding big blunders like the two that we've seen today you you crush you know you will crush because we don't have to look very far to find your big mistakes and blunders right now we can find them quite easily and that means that by eliminating them 
you can add so many BB per 100 to your win rate that it's unbelievable. You really can. So these games are beatable. But we've just got to zoom out and look at the full picture. All right, let's pick this up next time. And we will continue yes. our quest from stalling to mauling. Thanks, Jess. <laughs> see you next time. All right, see ya.